Greetings from Paranormal M, where reality meets the unknown. Subscribe and hit that like button so we can get bigger. And drop a comment. I'll write back. And join us as we stay updated on our latest journeys into the enigmatic. Prepare yourselves for a mind-expanding experience as we unravel the secrets of the paranormal. Haunted Hospital Toilet I was visiting my father who had been staying in a hospital for quite some time. So I decided to grab a snack. I ventured to the toilets nearest the cafe, noticing it was eerily quiet as being 3 p.m., the cafeteria lunch rush was over. So here I am, sitting alone in the middle cubicle of two empty toilets in total silence, halfway doing my business, and suddenly I hear a click. I find myself instantly sitting in complete darkness. My eyes are wide open. I'm in shock and utterly freaked out. I'm now rushing to finish grabbing the toilet paper, trying to pull up my pants, all at the same time telling myself to think rationally. Those lights are on a timer, and the button has just popped out. I fumbled with the lock in absolute sheer panic. I finally opened the cubicle door, reaching and just feeling for the basin, doing a crab walk along the wall, grabbing desperately for the main door, which felt like an eternity. I latch onto the door handle, fling it open, the heavy door pouring the outside light into the room. And there, on the inside of the wall, I see the light switch. And it's not on a timer. It's your standard switch. And it's in the off position. This toilet was located in the older section of the hospital to make matters worse. My experience was extremely creepy so bloody terrifying and somewhat traumatic that I actually feel apprehensive using public bathrooms to this day. I felt as though I was not alone in that bathroom, and I think that's why I got so panicked. Some bloody mischievous entity was having fun with me, it seems. I'm actually scared now just thinking about it. I hope this never happens to me, or ever again, or to you, or to me. Haunted Beauty Salon Okay, so I worked as a beauty therapist in a day spa. It was located in a small block of about six shops located close to the beach in Brighton, South Australia. There were often times I would work alone on a Thursday night for late night shopping. That was while all the other shops would close at 5 p.m. around me. Our heavy glass entry doors had a bell on it attached to a chain. This way I would hear customers entering the store. However, during a beauty treatment I would lock the glass doors as we had appointments booked in through the evening. One Thursday night, while I was alone, I went to the toilet quickly in between clients. Oh no. I always kept the door jar so I could hear the door. As soon as I sat down, the frickin' bell rang. So I rushed to get back onto the shop and greet the customer. When I entered the store, I noticed nobody was there. So I thought maybe they came in and left. Anyway, during the night I was shut in my beauty room doing a facial treatment and I heard the doorbell and the chain rattle. I thought it must have been my boss. She would be the only person to be entering the store at that time of night with a key as I heard high heels clicking down the tiled hallway. I left the room to get some hot water and set off down the hall. I could hear a tap, 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 click, 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 click in the keyboard to the office computer. I approached the office to expect to see my boss at the desk. I peeked in to find an empty room. Lights on, monitor on. I stood there baffled, not understanding what was going on. I looked all around the salon for my boss, even opening the back door to the staff car park. There was no sign of anyone. I wanted to share my experience with my client, but didn't want to disturb her peace. Thankfully, nothing else happened that night. But I'm positive it had something to do with the graveyard that's across the road. It really spooked the hell out of me. The doorbell was known to ring. 
and no one would be there on several occasions to other staff members. It's just so weird I couldn't explain it. Curses are real and don't get enough credit. My father used to work as a carpenter. My parents are divorced now. But back when I was a weed little thing, he was renovating an old house in San Francisco. It was an old Victorian house that had seen fire, flood, and homicide. But for whatever reason, it was otherwise going to be foreclosed, despite its historical salts. My father found an old key underneath the floorboards of this house, which has now lost time on account that the storage unit that my parents had was put up for auction when they couldn't pay for it anymore. My father came home from work after demolishing some tile that was being replaced with this key, and ever since this happened, I've had a reoccurring dream. The dream takes place in an old, dusty room with shaded windows and the smell of tobacco. Mind you, I've never been inside this old house or even seen it. But in this dream, I'm walking through the front door only to be nose to nose with a bug-eyed mummified corpse. It seems to have bloated, dried, and be battered with dust and black water three times over. When we lock eyes, the corpse shrieks a blood-curdling sound through its gaping black mouth, shooting decaying material into my eyes. Then I wake up. My father stopped all the work on this house after the second day, because after having been in every single room to check for squatters before beginning his work, he was shrieked at. He left his wet saw, his tools, and the replacement tile there, never to return. As a result of his working tools being gone forever, my mother and I continued to stay in the hotel renovated into an apartment complex by the Bay Area where their marriage rotted as the corpse presumably did in that house. A few years passed, and though my parents' relationship was plagued with my father's infidelity and my mother's substance abuse, my brother came. At age 14, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and claims without me telling him about my dream that the corpse lingers in his bedroom. It shrieks at him, and it finds humor in doing so. He since left to live across the country with my father, and the corpse followed him. My reoccurring dream of this corpse ceased to grace my sleep. Peace is restored in my mother and new stepfather's home, but at what cost? I worry for my brother each day that goes by. Perhaps this being of rot is not a hallucination, but a curse that has attached itself to him. My father deserves it, but not my brother. Haunted by Cloaked Shadow Figure I've always had a bit of what I call a spooky meter. I don't really have any better word for it than that. There have been times I will walk into a room and get a very unsettling feeling, and generally I seem to visually perceive it differently. Things will generally appear darker and dimmer than they ought to, as if the light swallowed it. As a bit of an example of my spooky radar going off, even in an exterior environment... I'm from Australia, and a couple of years back traveled to Cairns for work and met up with some people who worked for the same organization in the branch far north in Queensland. One of these whom I spent most time with happened to be Aboriginal, and in our time off she took me to a few touristy places. One of these went by a rock pool and I instantly got a horrible feeling, despite the fact that it was a sunny day and the sunlight appeared dull, dim, and gray. Kind of like that scene from Lord of the Rings when Frodo and Sam are traversing the mountains at the start of the two towers. Indeed, I remember instinctively I turned to her and said, This is a bad place. Her eyes lit up and she immediately began telling me that this was an area that had a lot of drownings. And 
that there's an old Aboriginal legend about a male and female from two separate tribes who fell in love, which was for reasons I'm not qualified to speak on, taboo. I'm probably going to butcher the story, so well, I do apologize. But in short, they were both punished and killed by that rock pool. And it's said that her energy remains there and holds anyone that comes there under the water. There's actually a super scary story about one case in which the local news took a photo of the spot after a man drowned there and published it in the newspaper. In the photo, the rocks form the shape of a man's face, which is super creepy. I tried to hunt down the photo, but I can't for the life of me find out. So you'll have to just take my word for it, or do your own research. As far as the drownings go, there is actually a scientific reason for this. At least, that I'm not familiar with that you can search up if you like. However, aboriginals have a rich storytelling history. I'm conscious not to misrepresent a rich and fascinating culture that doesn't get enough attention and love in Australia. This is just what I've been taught. I think there's actually some truth in a lot of these. And I know people on here like Wendigo stories. Some indigenous tribes have a version of the Bendigo, although I'm not familiar with it. In my childhood home, which was built by my parents, so not a case of someone died here and is haunting it. A fact my unbelieving father regularly tells me, even to this day when my siblings and I repeat this story. We had a spare room, which always gave me the creeps toward the back of the house at the end of a long hallway. I should also mention, we lived on a farm fairly far from town, and on it, I've had a number of creepy experiences, but none like the ones I'm going to mention. I should also say, my father has lived in the house since the mid-twenties, along with a few housemates. Oh, since his mid-twenties one of which used to claim that the house was haunted. The only story my non-believing father told me that he couldn't explain was the stereo system which was unplugged beginning to blast music in the early hours of the morning. Firstly, when I was extremely young, too young perhaps to recall this, but it's been a core memory for me always. I was awoken in my room by something I thought to be my father. I don't remember seeing him or what he looked like, only that I was lifted from my cot and put on the floor. He had large feet, and our hallway had a wooden floor. I remember crawling after him and following the imprints from this bare foot that was made on the floor. That was until we go to the kitchen. Let's have ice cream, he said to me. He lifted me to the freezer, which was pretty high, way too high for me to reach. I grabbed the ice cream and began to eat it. It was dark at the time. And when the sun began to rise, my dad came back downstairs. I remember him asking me what I was doing, taking the ice cream off me. I told him I was eating the ice cream, and he had taken me to get it. He had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. He said he absolutely did not wake up in the middle of the night to get me some ice cream. When I've brought it up with him now as a young adult, he seems to remember it and claims I must have climbed it. Well, I'll tell you, there's absolutely no way I could have climbed it. I was perhaps four, maybe five. I recall playing with my brother and two sisters at the end of the hallway opposite the room. We saw a black hooded figure that was blurry and smoky, if you like. Depiction attached at the end of the story. It ran past us at a ridiculous speed, went into the spare room, slamming the door behind it. We all screamed. We carried on, and then I guess forgot about it. Put it down to being young and overly imaginative. Despite of this, however, we never entered that room if we didn't have to, and would always close the door or turn the light on in there. We would only find the door open and the light off whenever we went back. Could have been our parents, but that all changed when I was twelve. My brother, who was two years older than me, we shared a room for our whole childhood. When my brother transitioned to high school, my parents thought it best to have our own rooms as he was staying up later and I'm sure puberty, well, <laughs> puberty also played a role. Excuse me. 
I was moved into the spare room, which, as I'd gotten older, sort of gotten over my fear of it. It was a simple room, fairly small and square. My bed was situated in the bottom left corner of the room. A desk ran along the wall beside it toward the door in which I mostly used for building Lego. The far left corner had a big-ass wooden wardrobe, which I never used. A window sat in the wall facing the door that never seemed to let enough light in, despite its size, and the entire right-hand side of the room was just a giant cupboard with sliding doors. My walls were also covered in posters, which is important to note. I spent anywhere between two weeks to a month in hell when I first moved into that room. From the get-go, my spooky radar went pretty haywire and I didn't really like being in there. I will do my best to recount the instances that I remember, although there aren't a whole lot. For reference, I spent every night of that initial month in there unable to sleep and battling all manner of strange occurrences. There are probably like 21 nights worth of scary instances, most that I can't recall, and probably deliberately tried to forget. The first occurrences were fairly tame. So I used to have a pedestal fan running most nights. It created a pretty heavy white noise. Because of that, I can't really confirm whether what I heard was real or not. But initially, I could hear whispering throughout the night. It used to put me super on edge, especially since it was just faint enough that I couldn't discern if I was crazy or not. So already my sleep started getting pretty bad. Then things started to get worse. My floor was carpeted, and I would begin to hear that soft sort of crumpling sound you hear when somebody's walking on it. The footsteps were slow, and would always come toward me and would come from the wardrobe in the corner of the room. Strangely, most things would occur from the wardrobe in the corner. I remember I initially had a lamp in my room which I would turn on as soon as I heard anything. But after way too short of a time, the bulb blew. The lamp never worked again no matter how many bulbs we put into it. Later on, I transitioned to using my iPod for a light. And that was then when one of those torch apps, and this I always sort of kept at my side. It became necessary for me to sleep facing the door, as every time I did finally get to sleep, if I was facing the wall, I would get a horrific nightmare. Sometimes I would fall asleep facing the door, have a nightmare, wake up to find that I had rolled over in the night. I began to wake up periodically in the night to strange noises. Things would move around, even fall off shelves. This was actually trackable, and I began to truly confirm my strong suspicion that something was amiss. I'm not Christian, but I am open-minded, and despite my lack of belief that God plays a part in this story... Strangely, I began to wake at 3 a.m., which is known as the witching hour. I didn't know this until I consulted the resident spooky expert of my school. We're going to call that James for the sake of the story. He was just a kid who had seen way too many horror movies. James told me that my room was likely haunted and that I should try to record it through the night. Knowing this, I set my iPod up to charge overnight. I used a voice recorder app to record the sounds during it. I tried video first, but my phone would overheat and die too quickly. Probably wouldn't have had enough storage space either for an 8-hour recording anyway. Old technology wasn't as capable as it is now. But strangely, the recordings would always stop at random intervals as though somebody had pressed stop. I had a passcode, so that was impossible. So those amounted to nothing. Things got worse again. One day I felt as though my duvet was moving. I didn't think much of it because I used to really have it fall down the side of my bed because of its weight sometimes. This time it felt as though it were rising. Before I could really clock it, a hand touched my back. It wasn't freezing cold like the movies, nor did it burn me or anything like that. It just felt like a human hand placed itself on my back. I recoiled naturally, probably spent the rest of the night with the light on. From then on, I used to tuck my blanket underneath my body, which was basically a habit at this point, and I maintained it until I was like 18 thanks to that experience. 
Another time, my blanket felt like it was falling down the bed again. So I grabbed it, went to pull it back. Only it didn't move. Initially, I thought it was stuck on something, but no matter how hard I pulled, it didn't move. That's when the blanket was pulled back. I remember my heart fucking raced. I essentially played tug of war with a fucking ghost for 30 seconds before it let up and I flew backward with the blanket having been pulled with all my strength and going back and forth prior to it. After that, I remember things getting borderline awful. I basically didn't ever sleep. I spoke to James about it and how things seemed to be getting worse and how outright terrified I was now. He speculated that it may be feeding on my fear and growing stronger with each passing night. This notion obviously horrified me. I asked him what I could do. He actually suggested I pray, funnily enough. Told me a few things I could say that had worked in some horrors he'd seen. I don't remember the order of operations, but I do know is that one night things were especially bad. Whispering, objects moving around and falling, strange noises and footsteps. I couldn't take it anymore. So, I prayed. I prayed that I be given the strength and courage to face the thing. And I prayed that whatever is in my room go fuck off back to wherever it came from. I recall this next part perfectly, and will likely never forget it. I sat up in my bed and yelled, In the name of God, I banish you from my room. I remember raising my fists as though I was prepared to fight it with my bare hands. I think my courage was fueled by the belief that God was on my side. From the corner of my room rushed the same hooded black figure I saw in my childhood. It was like a misty blur. It moved so quickly that it generated a wind that swept across the room as it ran. It blew off all my posters and knocking over my Lego on my desk, which smashed onto the floor. It rushed to the exit of my room and stopped in the doorway. I remember it turned and looked at me for only about half a second. But what gives me the chills was the speed that it moved. In its time, I dare say it stared a lot longer than I perceived it. I remember I fell asleep after that in pure exhaustion. I slept like a fucking baby. When I woke up, I thought I'd imagined or dreamt the whole thing. But when I looked around in my room, the thing was fucking trashed. It was trashed so badly that I remember my dad came in and told me it looked like a hurricane had passed through it. He didn't believe me when I told him what happened. I think he believed that I believed it. But some people, I guess, just have never had an experience and therefore refuse to bind to whatever somebody else is telling in a story. That's fair enough, I suppose. Nothing happened after that. I never forgot about what occurred, and it even made me into a devout Christian for like 12 months. The only thing that occurred involving whatever the thing was came when I was about 15. We had what used to be a toy or playroom, they got converted into a gym room with a treadmill and a bench and a computer in the kids' room. I was working out in it one day while my sister was playing on the computer. I remember she looked over my shoulder and screamed. She said she saw a black hooded figure behind me, that it was blurry and hazel like it was made of smoke. It was apparently watching me, and then it ran away when she screamed. That was the last I've ever seen it. It's funny, though, because a lot of people apparently have seen the cloaked bastard during sleep paralysis. That's how I found the photo below. But I know I was awake when I saw it. And if you can't believe me, then believe my siblings. I've had some other spooky tales. One that shook me a little bit that's much shorter. That's probably the best example of my spooky radar in action. Anyway, here's the photo of the demon. I wish I could show you guys, because I want to see too. The biggest reason I became a paranormal investigator. Back in October of 2004, I lost a cousin that I was close to due to an accidental overdose. 
His brother Mick and I are even closer, because we're close to the same age and pretty much we're raised in the same house as brother and sister. One day in February of 2005, Mick called me. He sounded very upset about a phone call that he'd received. So I told him to come to my house so I could figure out what he was talking about. When he got out of his car, he was white as a sheet and shaking. This is what he told me when he was able to calm down. He said he was driving when his phone rang. It was one of his parents calling from their house. Since he was driving, he let the call go to voicemail and pulled over a call back, not bothering to listen to the voicemail in the process. He said his dad answered the phone and both his parents denied even calling him in the first place. This was in spite of Mick's caller ID clearly indicating somebody in the house had called him when the voicemail was recorded. After hanging up with his parents, Mick decided to see what the voicemail had to say. After he listened to it, that's when he had called me in a panic. He refused to tell me anything about the voicemail. Instead, he queued it up and shoved the phone up to my ear so I could hear it for myself. I will never forget that voicemail. I felt the color drain from my face and I felt like I was going to pass out. I distinctly heard my cousin, who had been dead for nearly four months at this point. They said, It's me, I'm here, and I need your help. My cousin also had a very unusual cadence, and a sound, too, to his speech. It was unmistakably him leaving a voicemail from his parents' home phone number where he accidentally overdosed and lost his life. Unfortunately, 11 years later, there was a house fire that destroyed everything in the house. And this includes the voicemail that we had pulled off Mick's phone and saved on a computer. That voicemail changed my life drastically. My cousin and I dove into researching the paranormal ever since. I really wish I still had that voicemail recording. I know there are skeptics who aren't going to believe my experience, but I wanted to share why I became an investigator in the first place. Why did any of you get into the paranormal? I'd love to hear your experiences as well. And the narrator would like to bump that sentiment. The Warnings Due to the nature of my job, I will be changing the names of everybody involved and or affected by one of the most terrifying nights I've ever had. The things I'm about to share actually happened to me one night while at work. I am what's known as a personal care attendant, or a direct support worker. I work one-on-one -on -one with a disabled client. My client at the time was around 29 years old and in a freak accident three years prior. He was accidentally shot in the neck by a stray bullet when he was sitting outside in his grandpa's porch. This left him as a quadriplegic. I've worked for him for many years. He lived in my cousin's home with his four daughters. At that time, I worked from 5 p.m. to 7 a.m. while my cousin was at work. I do everything my client is unable to do, like housework to cooking to daily tasks he needs help with, as well as taking care of his four kids. After I put all the kids to bed and got Nate settled for the night, I went through the house and made sure all the lights were turned off and all the doors were locked. They had a security system as well, but for some reason I forgot to arm it. It was like 10 o'clock that night when I went to my cousin's bedroom to watch a movie on his laptop before going to sleep. About an hour into the movie, I headed to the kitchen for something to drink. It was dark but I'm used to the layout and it didn't really bother me turning the lights on. And when I heard a sound coming from the front door, I immediately recognized it. It was the doorknob rattling. I've experienced a lot of paranormal activity over the years in this house. And I peeked out to see if anybody was at the door, and I saw no one. So I assumed it was just that. I checked all the doors and windows and made sure everyone was okay and went back to the bedroom to finish my movie. After about ten minutes, my laptop started acting up. It froze. It was making a really high-pitched noise I'd never heard before. I restarted it, and it did it again. I shrugged it off and decided I was getting tired. Anyway, I thought about going to bed. 
I started to lie down when I heard footsteps in the hallway leading into the direction of the kids' room and the bedroom that I was in. So I got up and flipped the hall light on and peeked out the door into the hallway. No one. But I again walked through the house checking on everybody and making sure everything was locked up. I started feeling very, very anxious at this point, and I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep now. So I turned the TV on and the volume down so I didn't disturb anybody. And that's when I heard a very familiar voice say my name. It sounded exactly like my dad, except my dad passed away nearly ten years prior to this. I sat up and looked around the room, and again, no one. Now I'm thinking I'm not going to sleep at all. The activity was kicking up more than usual, so I decided to use the voice recorder to figure out what was going on. I captured the voice of a young boy, my client's children, they're all girls by the way, and after asking some questions it sounded like he said, we need to be careful. I tried to ask more questions, but I was so tired. Out of the corner in my eye, in a large picture frame, I saw something move. I also heard the movement and turned to look. I couldn't see anything in front of me, but I swear to God I could see my uncle, who had passed a few years prior as well. I saw his reflection in the glass of the picture frame. Then I heard him say, You can't go to sleep. I'm a paranormal investigator, and not a lot freaks me out, but I'd never experienced this kind of activity before. It was close to 2 a.m. at this point, and almost three hours of constant unexplained activity. I decided I'd had enough and I walked over to the nightstand, grabbed the remote to arm the security system, pushed the button to arm it and thought, this is crazy. I need to just try to get some sleep. I had to be up in a few hours to get the girls ready for school. I stuck my knee on the bed and at that exact moment somebody kicked in the back door to the house, which was located in the kitchen. The security system went off. It was extremely loud and lights were flashing all over the outside of the house grabbed my phone, ran toward the open back door. I didn't see anyone, but I still dialed 911. One of my biggest fears is somebody breaking in, and as I was on the phone, I was checking to make sure everyone was alright and there wasn't anybody actually in the house. My cousin called because the security system company had called him because of the alarm being triggered. He had told them it was probably an accident. I told him, call him back. Somebody just kicked in your fucking back door and I'm not turning this alarm system off until the police get here. We never found out who tried to break in the house, but you cannot convince me that all the paranormal activity I experienced that night was not a warning about what was going to happen that night. It was truly as if they were purposely doing things to get my attention so I wouldn't forget to set that alarm by keeping me awake. I'm not really afraid of the paranormal and it's just a, well... I tend to worry about the living, and this is a perfect example of that. Best friend lost mom, and she visited me in a dream last night. My best friend for over 30 years lost his mother a week ago. I always loved his parents, and they were very kind to me over the years. I actually met them at church as a teenager. While I'm not religious, his parents were very much so. I rarely dream about my own family that passed on, but let alone anybody else's deceased family members. I'm not implying I'm a psychic or a medium of any kind, but this was truly different than any dream I've ever had. We were sitting at a table together in what appeared to be a restaurant. My friend's mother asked me if I would pass on some things that she needed him to know. I said I would. She wanted me to tell her son that she's always been proud of him. But secondly, and most importantly, she wanted to tell him how sorry she was for ever doubting his capabilities, and that she was also sorry that she made him feel like he wasn't good enough. I asked her, why are you coming to me like this and not telling him yourself? She responded by saying, Because he's not ready to see me, and he will listen to you and believe you. He wouldn't ever believe anyone else. I was pretty nervous about approaching my friend with this information. I wasn't sure if this was just a silly dream or if it was really something I needed to tell him. 
I chose to tell him. I let him know I have no idea whether what she told me would make sense to him or not. He was adamant that everything I had said had a lot of truth behind it, and that it made perfect sense to him. Has anybody else ever experienced something like this? How did you end up handling it? I'm hoping I did the right thing, but I really don't want people's deceased relatives coming to me in my dreams to pass along messages. Like I said, I'm not a psychic or anything like that. Maybe just intuitive, since I'm an empath. Only way I can explain it. Creepy coincidence or a sign from a deceased loved one? You decide. I need to share a little context and backstory first. My dad suffered a massive stroke and passed away in 2006. When I was 10, my parents divorced. My dad moved to a different town, which meant I spent my weekends at my dad's house with my older brother and younger sister. Around Christmas in 1989, my brother gave my dad a Zippo that had a very small rectangular gold metal plate that had been engraved with my dad's initials. MRF. My dad was not much of a cook. The best thing he made was elbow pasta with stewed tomatoes and sweet and low. Blech. So when we were with him, most of the time we ate at a little restaurant. The town he lived in was extremely small and had only this one restaurant. Four years after we lost Dad, my brother and friend happened to be driving through that same little town and they decided to stop and eat at that restaurant. When my brother was getting out of the car... Something shiny on the ground in the parking lot caught his attention. He was thinking he might have dropped something when getting out of the car. He bent over and picked it up, not believing what he was seeing. It was the little gold plate that had Dad's initials on it. M.R.F. Must have fallen off the Zippo my brother had given him years ago. It had been over 15 years since any of us had been to that restaurant. What are the odds? Is it a coincidence, or is it a sign for my dad? What do you think it was? I know what I believe it to be. Just curious to see outsiders' perspective about it. My first paranormal investigation. When I was a teenager, I had a friend whose dad, his name was Charlie. They were the caretaker of our town cemetery. One day after Charlie got home from work, he told us that an elderly man had come put flowers on his wife's grave earlier that day. This man found Charlie and was very visibly very upset and reported what sounded like scratching coming from her grave. He demanded that his wife's grave be dug up. He was convinced she was alive. This was not possible. She'd been dead for some years. We thought her dad was just making this whole story up to scare us. We didn't take him seriously at all. He said, I can prove it to you if you'd like. Let's go check it out. You tell me what you hear. So, we all get in the car and drove to the cemetery. Charlie parked his car about 20 feet from the grave and we got out and followed him. We were standing around this grave and nobody could hear anything. So he started laughing and began walking back to the car. Charlie says, No, you've got to put your ear up to it to hear it. So we walked back and knelt down. I put my ear up to the grave. I heard what sounded like fingernails scratching inside that grave. We believed him after that, but of course, the woman was not alive and the scratching to get out like her poor husband wanted. Ah. <sighs> Turns out her mausoleum had flooded, and the scratching sound was her casket that had floated to the top. That's almost just as creepy if you ask me. So technically, that was my first paranormal investigation that ended up being completely debunked. I've since investigated that cemetery more times than I can count. I've seen and heard a lot of unexplained things there. A lot of families buried there too. I've never felt anything negative. In fact, it's quite peaceful. One of the only places I'm comfortable investigating alone.
ghost story from my past. A family cousin recently reminded me of an experience, and this was an experience from when I was around 12. I hadn't thought about it in so long that I'd nearly forgotten it even happened. Growing up, my cousins and I spent a lot of time at my grandparents' house. We all lived in a small community. We were all around the same age. Their house was pretty central in the community. We often met up there to hang out. There were many old paths that used to be narrow roads leading to different gathering spots around the community. And one of them ran directly through my grandparents' backyard. The kids loved using them to quickly jump between houses and meet other groups just to hang out. There were a handful of local ghost stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. Most were pretty typical. They were about abandoned houses and such. One story that was well known and had been passed down to us was about how a town hall had once hosted weekly games of bingo. There was a man who never missed it and routinely walked the same route from his home to the town hall for bingo every Tuesday evening. The path he would have taken from his home to the town hall passed through my grandparents' property. Despite using that trail often, I can't remember ever being particularly concerned about crossing paths with the ghost. One evening, my cousin and I had just finished dinner at my grandparents'. They were sitting at their porch, and that's when they noticed movement coming through the trees on the trail. We watched, waiting to see who was coming to join us. We could clearly see that it was an adult male wearing a newsboy-style cap. The entire moment felt out of place. Both of us remember how clearly we could see him walking toward the portion that cut through the backyard but he never emerged from the trees. I hope he wasn't disappointed when he arrived at the hall that hadn't hosted a bingo night in a decade. Just beyond the property line. It all started in August of 2018. It was a humid night with dark storm clouds that had been there for days, but no rain. This was, and still is, a normal occurrence around where I used to live. I was in eighth grade, and the school year had just started. I'm putting clothes away in my dresser, which is by my bedroom window, and I look outside. My room looks out onto the backyard, and there's a line where the grass ends and a swampy wetland starts. Between that line was a field. The field was full of tall grass and what I think was called millet. The field ends with a stream that cuts the field off from the rest of the public property. Anyway, I looked out my window, and there was a girl standing in the field, about five foot four, brown, bushy hair and dark eyes. The girl was dressed in rags and had no shoes on. I opened my window to call out to her, but before I did, she did the hand sign that I have my eye on you. The two fingers that you point at your eyes and then to the person you're motioning at. I did a double take, and she disappeared. I called out to my mom, who's in the kitchen. I asked her if there was any news about someone escaping the local mental hospital. The mental hospital was extremely old and was notorious for treating people horribly. Most of the buildings were rotten, and the ones that left held the criminally insane. My mom asked why I told her about the girl in the backyard. She thought I was joking because the kitchen also had a window that looked out to that backyard and she hadn't seen anything last time she looked. So now my mom thought I was just joking. Later that night I told my brothers what I saw. They thought I was messing with them too. They don't believe in ghosts at all. They trust science over superstition, which is perfectly reasonable. But unlike my brothers, I've accepted that science can't explain everything, no matter how hard they might try. A couple of days later, I was walking up to the bus stop on what the kids on my street called a Navy Skies. It's where it's bright as a sunny day, but you can't see the sun because there's sort of a navy blue storm cloud as far as your eye can see, to the point where it blends with the horizon. When these things happen, it means that storm clouds have been building up for days with no rain. 
The day these clouds appear, it will start raining in the next six hours, heavy. So I'm walking out of the side door of the garage, which faces the field, and surprise, surprise, she's there. Again, I yelp. My twin brother comes out of the garage and asks me what's wrong. I told him about the ghost girl being there again. He cleans his glasses, says he doesn't see anything. We shrug it off and walk up the hill to the bus stop to see the girl who lives down the street, who I'll call Jay. We say our good mornings and acknowledge the weather. I then tell her about the ghost girl. Jay then freaks out. Jay comes from a super religious family to the point where they never let her read Harry Potter. She then whispers to me. My family almost didn't move here because they heard that the swamp that the neighborhood was built on was haunted. A couple of hours after school ended, she came down to my house and gave me a copy of the Bible, a cross and a necklace. And get this, a jar of freshly made holy water. I gave her back the Bible, we already owned several, and the necklace, but I kept the holy water around for safekeeping. To this day I still have that jar of holy water, but I keep it as a memento. And besides, after a few more visits from this ghost girl, I got fed up and used sigil magic and folk magic to get rid of the ghost from the field. It probably worked, because I never saw it again after that. I was talking to my mom around Thanksgiving and told her about the ghost girl. She told me that she once saw a girl who matched the description of the ghost walking around the neighborhood once. When she tried to ask who the girl was, she vanished into thin air. Scared the crap out of her. Middle School Ghost He's super freaked out, so I decided to tell you all. My brother goes to the same middle school I did when I was his age. I remember a casual conversation with my health teacher, who was also the gym teacher. They were telling us about a kid playing basketball. We were in a brand new middle school, and the old middle school was about 30 feet from the new one. He had been the gym teacher at the old middle school, but... And I forget, like, what year, but the kid whose name I can't even remember, they had heart problems. They were playing basketball in the gym during gym class. Then the kid collapsed. My teacher ran over and 911 was called. It was too late. By the time my teacher got to him, he was dead. Then everyone in the gym, which was about 50 to 100 people, had to watch as the paramedics took away the body, bawling their eyes out. The memory still haunts him. When the new school was built, they put a framed photo of him in the trophy case with the rose. Anyway, they still use the old middle school as the rec center because it has a pool. Anyway, my brother's friend had lacrosse practice the day before and forgot his bag. He was scared to go to the gym alone. So he brought his brother. Or my brother. So they went into the gym and the only person that was there was a kid playing basketball. When they opened the door, the kid turned to them and disappeared. They ran back into the school screaming bloody murder. When they told a teacher, they ended up in the principal's office with the principal and my old health teacher. When they told him what the kid looked like, my old teacher crumpled. They had described what he looked like down to a t-shirt. The principal gave them detention for sneaking into the rec center. But some kid was using the bathroom and heard the commotion and told everybody. By the time school let out, everyone knew, and some teachers let class out early so kids wouldn't have to see them cry. So that leads up to now. Mom doesn't believe him, neither does our dad or the principal. But I do, and so does my old teacher. Can someone give me tips on what to do about a child spirit? I know I banished that ghost girl in my backyard, but I met this kid once when I was little. I just kind of feel kind of broken on what to do. Please, give me some advice. My Grandmother's Mirror Encounter Hello. I've been recently being delving into paranormal experiences in and out of my family, mostly to comfort my crippling thanatophobia. 
and asked for some good stories for my mom. They gave me a story regarding her mother. First, let's find out what thanatophobia is. Regardless of how I pronounced it, it seems that thanatophobia is the fear or anxiety surrounding the fear of death. I digress back to the story. Grandma and my great-uncle, who I'll be calling V and R respectively, moved to Canada when they were around 7 and 8, around 1962. They were German and were still getting used to the language. Now my great-uncle R is a strict and firm atheist who doesn't believe in ghosts, God, or the afterlife. But this story shakes him to this day and he refuses to talk about it. V and R were around 10 and 9 when this happened. They were getting ready for bed. But Grandma V was too scared to go downstairs and brush her teeth. She felt like the air was heavy, so R accompanied her and they went to the bathroom. They were then met with a young girl around five years old looking at Grandma and described to me as having a long brown hair and a onesie covered in red and blue and yellow splotches. The girl disappeared so soon as she arrived. V and R looked at each other and were able to perfectly describe the same description of the girl to one another. Where they promptly screamed, then they ran to bed. And to this day, Grandma hasn't told a soul what happened that night other than my mom and my late aunt, who then told it to me. A bad move. I want to preface this by saying I'm a recovering addict, and I've been clean for two years and three months when the occurrences began. Because I choose to maintain my anonymity as a recovering addict, in keeping with the traditions and principles of my program, I do not use my real name, nor do I use the actual names of anybody included in this recanting. I'm a college graduate and a career professional, but I will not disclose specifics in these areas either. I will use actual geographical locations, but will not disclose the address of the location where the story takes place. I am a very spiritual person, and it is my faith that saved my life. My faith and my mom, my recovery family. I was 43 years old when the events occurred. In November of 2012, after a painful breakup with a partner of 10 years, I, alongside my 7-year-old black lab retriever, Sora, moved out of a 2,500-square-foot house that I owned with my former partner, because we'd put it on the market. And we moved into a one side of a duplex that was just east of downtown Orlando. The ranch-style red brick two-bedroom unit was perfect. I recall feeling a sense of accomplishment in finding a place so close to downtown, especially because the rental rate was surprisingly low considering the location and space. I was less than a mile from the heart of the downtown on the outskirts of a highly desirable Eolia Heights. Less than half a block away, there was a beautiful city park that was maintained by the Orlando Horticulture Society. It was perfect for my morning and evening walks with Sora. Plus... The duplex had a fenced backyard that was perfect for those times and it was easier to just open the back door and let my precious pup out to do her business. The duplex was built in the late 1940s. The place had never been renovated and still had the original terrazzo floors and bathroom tiles and wood-stained kitchen cabinets. But it had been very well maintained and, while outdated, had a classic charm about it. The day I signed the lease, Mike, the guy from the property management company, informed me that they would not be leasing out the other side of the duplex any time soon, in air quotes. He didn't offer an explanation, and frankly, I was so thrilled over the fact that I would have privacy that I wouldn't have to deal with anybody else on the property that I didn't ask why. The only thought that came to mind was, well, there would be no complaints if I failed to scoop the poop on the occasion. If I had company, there would be no nosy neighbors minding my business. I could play my music as loud as I wished. If Sora barked, there would be no complaints. It represented freedom, pride.
privacy and a sense of pride in that I had found such a great place that was so affordable and a great location. Finding the place helped to somewhat ease the pain of the breakup, gave me a sense of independence. It was the first time in my life that I would live alone, or without a, another human, that is. I loved Sora. She was my best friend and a great companion. She enjoyed the fact that I started to let her jump into my bed and sleep next to me at night, and she loved the walks in the nearby park. Because I was so close to downtown and on a somewhat busy street, there was a fair amount of foot traffic. Not a lot of foot traffic at night, but enough so that the sound of people conversing as they walked by never struck me as being odd. I simply accepted it as part of the living room close to downtown. I kept my curtains closed all the time because I was close enough to the sidewalk that nosy passerbys could see inside my house. A couple of weeks after I'd moved in, it occurred to me that every night at around 11 p.m. I would hear what seemed to be the same voices engaged in the same undiscernible conversation. After about a week, my curiosity demanded that I see who these creatures of habit were, and at 11 p.m. I positioned myself by the front door. Like clockwork, at 11 p.m. on the dot, the same voices having the same muffled conversation could be heard starting at one end of the sidewalk in front of my duplex, was walking toward downtown. When I heard them talking, I started to open my front door. But as soon as I started to turn the doorknob, the conversation abruptly stopped. I opened the door and stepped out into the front porch. For the first time in my life, I was genuinely terrified. It just didn't make sense. There were no people at all. Not on the sidewalk, not on the street. It was just silent. I didn't even hear cars driving the busy stretch of East Colonial Drive just a few blocks away. That was the night things started to happen. It started with my precious dog. The sight of Sora retreating to the corner of the living room farthest from the front door, her whole body was trembling, burnt into my memory. I had to pick her up and carry her to the bedroom that night. That was also the night that the 11 p.m. voices stopped, but that's also the night when the really frightening things started up. What happened next convinced me that I was having a genuine paranormal experience. And it wasn't that scary noise in my house. Don't know what that was. Oh my God, where was I? I decided to start keeping a journal of my experiences. They started happening at all hours of the day and night. This is the order that the first occurrences happened. Saturday morning, November 10th, 2012, between 10.05 and 10.10 a.m. I was vacuuming my living room rug. The vacuum cleaner cuts off. Then I heard the voice of an elderly sounding man, as if only a couple of feet away from me. They said, What are you doing? Then the vacuum cut back on. Ran out of the house calling Sora to follow me. I wouldn't go back into the house until my N.A. sponsor came over three hours later. Tuesday morning, November 13th, 2012. Approximately 1.20 a.m. Awakened by the sound of something crashing onto the floor in the kitchen. It sounded like a stack of plates. I got up to investigate the cause and found that every light in the house was on except for my bedroom light. Wednesday morning, November 14th, 2012, approximately 1.30 a.m. I had recorded myself turning off all the lights throughout the house before going to bed. I was awakened again by what sounded like a stack of plates crashing to the floor. The lights in the living room and the kitchen were both on. I got up and turned them off. As I climbed into bed, both the kitchen and the living room lights came back on. I continued to document the strange occurrences, but would just write down the dates and times and then say, at least, well, last night. Unless there was a change, though, like the night that the lights in the living room turned on and off for about ten times, but by this time I had gotten over my trepidation of sharing these experiences with people I knew. I started to tell close friends about what I was experiencing, 
and much to my relief, the overwhelming response was loving and supportive. A friend of mine from recovery program suggested that I have the duplex blessed that wound up introducing me to an ordained minister from a nearby Unitarian church. I gratefully accepted my friend's offer to appeal to the minister to perform the blessing. On Saturday, December 9th of 2012, two ministers and three of my friends from the program came over and prayed and performed a blessing, then a sort of spiritual cleansing with sage. The ritual and prayer seemed to work. All unusual activity stopped. I had a great Christmas in my new digs and felt a tremendous sense of relief. Sora seemed to be returning to her normal, playful self. Really seemed that everything was going to be all right. Until the night of January 10th, 2013. I've gone over it again and again, trying to figure out what it was that caused the whole experience to start again. It was as if I was watching a movie, complete with the 11 p.m. phantom pedestrians. That night starting at around 11.15 p- 11.15 p.m., I called everybody who'd been part of the blessing and cleansing. They all, in turn, agreed to come back the next weekend. The next day, I called the property management company and spoke to Mike, the property manager, and the person that had done the lease signing with me. I asked him how long the unit I'd rented had been vacant before I moved in. Why wasn't the other unit being leased? and if the previous tenants had ever said anything about strange things happening in the unit. He only answered my first question before saying that he had an important call and would get back to me. It was around this date that I started getting sick. Not like a cold or a stomach ache sick, like seriously, painfully ill. It developed almost overnight. Ulcerative colitis. I have that too, even though I didn't have Crohn's disease. By the way, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are different only in the location of the gut that's being affected. Same autoimmune disease, for anybody interested. It was debilitating. It affected every aspect of my life. Then the infections came. This went on for weeks and caused me to have to take an extended medical leave of absence because I was put on IV antibiotics. I feel you. I was never one to get sick. I worked out daily, ate healthy, got plenty of rest, at least prior to moving into this duplex. And overall, I was very active, very healthy. Especially since I started my journey in recovery. My doctor was perplexed as to why my health had taken such a drastic turn. Then it happened. I was physically attacked. It was January 28th. I was pushed while stepping out of the tub. I fell to the floor. I've never been so scared. I started praying the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalms intermittently. I was doing this over and over. Balled up in a fetal position, too. I was terrified and had reached my breaking point. Almost as if on cue, my dear friend Rico called me. Got to my cell phone. I was crying. The only thing I heard from Rico was... Here's the deal. I'm coming to see you right now, and if you have plans, cancel them. This is urgent. I'll be there in two hours. I'll explain when I get there. And are you okay, by the way? Rico lived in Tampa. I hadn't seen or spoken to him since the weekend that I moved into the duplex. Rico was the type who visited his psychic every week. He would frequently include comments like, Well, Laura is psychic said I must do this, or Laura told me not to do, insert activity here, or, oh my God, she said this would happen. I adored Rico. I think that had it not been in a relationship when I first met him, I definitely would have pursued him. Whenever we were around each other, it was just an amazing time. I dressed quickly and grabbed Sora's leash. I drove to a nearby dog park and waited for Rico to call. I was not going back to that house alone. Rico called two hours later to tell me he'd arrived. He'd used my hidden spare key to get into my unit. When I got back to the house, I walked in through the back door and called to Rico, who responded, Do not close the back door! The smell of sage filled my whole house. I walked into the hallway, and there was Rico and some woman that I'd never seen before. 
Rika was waving his hands over a smoke roll of sage. He walked up to me, stared me in the eyes. Paul, this is Laura. Laura walked over and threw her arms around me, then leaned down and looking at Sora said, Why, yes, girl, we are here to help. As if she was responding to a direct question from Sora. Rico went on to tell me that when he arrived at Laura's house that morning, the only thing she said was for him to go to his friend Paul, and that she was coming along. She told Rico that Paul was in danger, and they had to sage Paul's house, not just once, but a few times, and to get a priest to bless the house. Rico then told me, Paul, I've never spoken your name to her before. She's always asking why I never give names, so that way her visions can be validated. When she said your name, I was already walking towards the door. What you are going through isn't a haunting, Paul. There is an evil here that will not stop inflicting harm until it's banished or destroyed. This is going to take so much more than I can do. Laura explained then, just as she finished speaking, I started feeling extremely nauseated. Sora ran out back from the door into the front backyard and or far end of the backyard, she started trembling. Then right in front of me, Rico and Laura, in broad daylight, two of the kitchen cabinets opened. The contents started falling out of the cabinets. I looked at both Rico and Laura. Both were terrified. Laura started praying. Heavenly Father, send your angels. Please protect us. Then I heard that same disembodied voice the day that my vacuum cleaner turned off and on. This time, Rico and Laura heard it too. It said the same thing. What are you doing? Another cabinet door swung open and slammed shut. The voice spoke again, but it was different. You know how Hollywood always portrays the voice when someone's possessed? They kind of got it right. It was like that. It was the voice of evil malevolent, and it screamed, What are you doing? I stood there trembling looking at the cabinets, weak and nauseated. I don't recall if it was Laura or Rico that grabbed my hand, and in all that candor until I started writing about the experience. Hadn't thought about that moment, only that I was pulled in the direction of the back door and out into the backyard, and that I was feeling more nauseated than I was just hyperventilating. I don't recall passing out either. I only recall waking up in the hospital. I woke up and immediately realized that I was in a hospital bed. I felt the, this is a big word, sphygmo, oh my gosh, sphygmo manometer, sphygmometer, cut off my right arm, and the IV needle inserted and taped to the left part of my hand. I tried to call out for Sora, but my throat was dry and nothing came out. My mom was sitting in a chair next to the hospital bed. She stood up and grabbed a call remote then walked quickly to the hospital room door and called out. He's waking up. Come quick, please. It's blurry and difficult to remember exactly what happened after that, other than nurses coming in and asking me if I knew where I was, and if I knew my name. But once I'd been assessed and was given a cup of ice water, the nurses left the room to find out that I could be cleared for dietary. My head started to clear. The reason I passed out and was now lying in a hospital bed it was that the infection had gotten worse. I was dehydrated and malnourished. In the days just prior to the attack, I hadn't eaten or drank anything, or really administered the IV antibiotics. Oh yeah, I forgot to include the part where I had to have a pick line inserted and then ripped out the first night that I was in the hospital. I had a prescription of IV antibiotics, the kind that are in a ball and puts the fluid into the pick line. I had to keep them refrigerated and was supposed to be self-administering three times a day. I digress. I had been consumed by what was going on in my life and it just started falling apart. I was circling the drain at a rate ten times faster than when I had been in active addiction. My mom took my hand and told me that she had already visited me twice and had picked up Sora and taken her home to my mom's house. Once mom was sure that I was coherent, she squeezed my hand pressed her other hand against my cheek. She stared into my eyes. I could see tears in hers. Then she told me that I was never to go back into that house. 
remember feeling such a tremendous sense of relief and crying, no, no bawling. My mom hugged me and then sat with me until I fell asleep. A few days later, I was discharged from the hospital. Mom picked me up. I really wasn't paying attention to where we were until we turned onto the street where the duplex was. I thought I started to speak, but then as we pulled up to the duplex, I saw my two brothers in their pickup trucks, several people from my program in a U-Haul. I am not exaggerating when I say that it took less than 30 minutes for everything I had in that house to be removed and loaded onto the trucks. We caravaned to the house I owned with my former partner, who was waiting at the house when we all pulled up. We picked up my Jeep and parked it at the garage. Tim, my ex, met me at the car door. I stepped out of the car and he hugged me. This doesn't mean that we're getting back together, but I do love you, and you gave everybody a real scare. This is where you belong, for now. I laughed, thinking to myself, you have no idea what a real scare is. Within a week, my health had started to return. The ulcerative colitis was gone. So were the infections. I forgot to mention that Sora had just been starting to lose her fur. Within three weeks her fur had grown back, she was vibrant and healthy. I called the property management company and advised them that I had vacated the duplex and I demanded my deposit back. I advised them that I had enough witnesses to attest to everything that happened to me. I was able to get the name and contact information of the people who had leased the unit before me, and they shared their experience with me. They had experienced the exact same things I had. They had also done a bit of research. The property had a dark past that spanned decades. Three suicides, a home invasion that resulted in two murders in the unit that wasn't rented, I was able to find a newspaper article about the home invasion. The property management company mailed my deposit and refunded me two months' rent. What they did is not disclose the property's past. It's pretty unethical, and now, in most states, it's illegal. In the years since, I avoided going anywhere near that property. If I was driving, I would detour around that stretch of road. The most important thing for me personally is that through the entire months-long episode, I stayed clean. My spiritual condition was solid. The duplex was raised in 2019. And the next stories will be tomorrow. See you then.